Europe has been continuously inhabited by modern humans for more than 40,000 years. Before them, other hominin species lived there, and there is no doubt today that all European populations inherited small amounts of Neanderthal DNA. There is definitely so much we know thanks to Paleolithic genomes, but the most precise and relevant information considering modern admixture proportions in Europe dates back to the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, and Early Bronze Age. The arrival of the so-called Neolithic farmers changed both the gene pool and the lifestyle, groups known for building most of the incredible megalithic monuments. They came from Anatolia, and in many areas, they replaced the previous Mesolithic population, but the interactions between both groups were complex, and ancient DNA studies demonstrate that this is only one side of the coin. It's time then to discuss the resurgence of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry in Europe, a phenomenon that took place in the Middle Neolithic, and also, we will see that in the Chalcolithic period and Early Bronze Age, the steppe people from Eastern Europe played an important role as well. Key to understand modern European genetics. Welcome to Ancient Puzzles. The genetic origin of modern Europeans is a very interesting subject I wanted to cover since I made the video on the proto-megalithic site of Campo de Jaque in southwestern Iberia. I highly recommend you to watch it, and you'll find the link in the video description. Part of this video is dedicated to ancient DNA results of six Neolithic individuals found at the site, and it turns out that one of them has higher levels of European Mesolithic hunter-gatherer-related ancestry that the authors link to the resurgence phenomenon, just mentioned in the introduction. As already stated, this seems to be more typical in the Middle Neolithic, but the samples listed in that scientific report are slightly older, so I decided to do some research and put something together. I had to check a lot of scientific reports and articles, and you have them linked in the video description. I could not use all the content I wanted, but I did my best to make the video as illustrative as possible. Special thanks to all the scientists who publish research on this fascinating topic, as well as enthusiasts like Ancestral Whispers, Ancient Europeans, Waters of Memory, and Damien Marie at Hope, for allowing me to use some of their amazing creations. And now, let's jump into it. We're going to start taking a closer look at the Neolithic and Mesolithic ancestries studied in Europe. The Neolithic farmer ancestry came essentially from an Anatolian source and was spread over thousands of years by different cultural groups. The earliest presence in Europe has been reported in the Balkans dating back to 8,500 years ago, but didn't reach certain areas until 4,000 BC and more than 1,500 years later in some cases. It's important to note that early Anatolian farmers had three deep hunter-gatherer ancestries. Local from Anatolia, Caucasus hunter-gatherer ancestry coming from a Mesopotamian source and additional Levantine-related gene flow originating roughly 9,000 years before present and rapidly spreading towards southeastern Europe. The highest proportions of this ancestry are today found around the Mediterranean basin, particularly in southern Europe. As for the Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry, there are many different sources, but let's start with the main ones. Western hunter-gatherer ancestry is the name given to the ancestral component of the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who lived in Western, Southern, and Central Europe before the Neolithic farmers expanded. The oldest samples were found north of the Alps and estimated to be around 14,000 years old, and today this ancestry is most common among populations of the Eastern Baltic region. Next, Eastern hunter-gatherer ancestry is the ancestral component of the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers of Eastern Europe, who were present in the area stretching from the Baltic to the Urals and downwards to the Pontic Caspian steppe. Part of their ancestry is the same found among Western hunter-gatherers, but having also up to 75% ancient North Eurasian admixture, characteristic of Siberian Upper Paleolithic populations. And the last of these relevant ancestries is Caucasus hunter-gatherer ancestry that diverged from Anatolian hunter-gatherers around 25,000 years ago 
although the most representative samples were discovered in Georgia and range between 13,300 and 9,700 BP. This admixture was also carried by Neolithic Iranians, who derived most of their ancestry from that source. And the modern distribution of this component seems quite significant throughout West Asia and South Asia. Having mentioned these three ancestral components, there's also quite a lot to say about local hunter-gatherer ancestries. This map shows the hunter-gatherer groups mostly discussed in ancient DNA studies. Ukraine hunter-gatherers, Baltic hunter-gatherers, Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, and Balkan hunter-gatherers that can be modeled using Western hunter-gatherer and Eastern hunter-gatherer or Paleo-Siberian references. With the exception of Balkan hunter-gatherers, who also share part of their ancestry with Neolithic Anatolians. And the unique Iberian hunter-gatherers that carry very high levels of Upper Paleolithic Magdalenian admixture. All these groups were of course important, but it's worth mentioning that the Balkan hunter-gatherers, normally labeled as Iron Gates hunter-gatherers, expanded significantly during the Mesolithic, replacing most of the Eastern hunter-gatherer component in individuals from Southern Sweden and add mixing with Iberian hunter-gatherers in Northern Iberia. And here's another map including admixture proportions, showing Upper Paleolithic admixture in non-Iberian samples, as well as Balkan hunter-gatherer admixture among Baltic and Ukrainian individuals, reported in the latter to have increased after 10,000 BP. Local hunter-gatherer groups in Europe definitely interacted during the Mesolithic, so let's now see what ancient DNA revealed about farmers and hunter-gatherers in that regard. The estimated Mesolithic admixture for early Neolithic farmers rarely exceeds 10%, but there are notable exceptions in Southern, Central, and Northern Europe that range from 25 to more than 50% Mesolithic ancestry. When it comes to the Western Mediterranean, it will take time to understand the full complexity of the Neolithization process, but ancient DNA reveals that there were contacts between farmers and hunter-gatherers already during the early Neolithic. Research in southern France has found early Neolithic individuals having between 22.9 and 57.6% Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry, and others having between 24.5 and 41.9%, all discovered in southeastern France. Herein reported early Neolithic genomes from Portugal, Western Cardial, are estimated to harbor between 27 and 43% Iberian hunter-gatherer admixture. And let's not forget about the proto-megalithic site of Campo de Haque in southwestern Iberia, where a sample having 27% Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry was identified. And in the rest of Europe, there were regional differences to discuss but more early Neolithic outliers have been reported. The most remarkable one is probably an individual associated with the Koros culture, Eastern Hungary, estimated to be around 7,500 years old, that has approximately 80% hunter-gatherer ancestry, results that were published in 2017, along with additional evidence supporting interactions between Anatolian migrants and local hunter-gatherers, were taking place already in the early Neolithic. Another example I came across is covered in a study about genomes from the Braun II site of the Braun M. Jeberjwolfholz archaeological complex, located south of Vienna, Austria, dated between 5,670 and 5,350 BC, which corresponds to the earliest state of development of the linear pottery culture, and I was quite surprised to see a sample, estimated to harbor more than 50% Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. And in Sweden, early Neolithic samples associated with the funnel beaker culture are close to Middle Neolithic Europeans, who normally had higher levels of hunter-gatherer ancestry. So there are many examples proving early interactions between farmers and hunter-gatherers that definitely show there's a background for the increased hunter-gatherer ancestry in Europe's Middle Neolithic samples, and here we can see the difference in admixture proportions next to early farmers. It's a trend that has not been observed in Britain, where the levels of Western hunter-gatherer admixture in many individuals analyzed are certainly among the highest found in Neolithic populations anywhere in Europe. But unlike other areas of the continent, 
it seems there was no increase of this ancestry in the later stages of the British Neolithic. Particularly interesting regarding the Middle Neolithic are four individuals from the Bladderhole Cave in Germany, three of them classified as farmers that had between 40 and 50 percent hunter-gatherer ancestry, and the other one associated with a hunter-gatherer-fisher lifestyle, estimated to harbor 73 percent hunter-gatherer admixture, results that were published in the Lipson et al. 2017 paper, shown a few moments ago. During the late Neolithic, hunter-gatherer ancestry kept rising in some regions, like central Poland for example, where the evidence suggests this happened from the early Neolithic until the late Neolithic. In southern Europe, Iberia shows a similar trend, but it's completely different in Italy, where Neolithic individuals carry small amounts of ancestry found in Caucasus hunter-gatherer and Neolithic Iranian populations. Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry did not increase significantly in the earlier stages of the Italian Neolithic, but a small gradual rebound of Western hunter-gatherer ancestry has been reported in late Neolithic and Cooper age samples. Late Neolithic individuals having very high hunter-gatherer admixture have also been reported in Germany, where samples belonging to the Warburg culture carry between 34 and 58 percent of this ancestry, and there is more. Another interesting sample in southeastern Europe, specifically from the Gura Bacilui site in Romania, was estimated to be 5,300 years old, Eneolithic period basically, and to harbor 61.7% Mesolithic ancestry, which is definitely a lot higher than what most admixed European Eneolithic or Chalcolithic farmers normally have. The higher hunter-gatherer admixture reported in Central Europe, Iberia, and the Balkans, from the Middle Neolithic onwards, it was likely the result of males spreading more ancestry than females, coinciding also with hunter-gatherer-associated Y chromosomes becoming more common, unlike the maternal lines. Also, lots of individuals with little or no farmer ancestry still existed in Scandinavia, the Baltic and Eastern Europe, even at the end of the Neolithic. These, for example, are the pitted where culture individuals who inhabited the Baltic island of Gotland and Sweden. And in Ukraine's lower Dnipro Valley region, the direct descendants of the Mesolithic population, having also in this case Paleo-Siberian and Western hunter-gatherer ancestry, continued being the dominant group for thousands of years after the start of the European Neolithization and cultural innovations such as the adoption of pottery, pioneer animal husbandry, and the changes from contracted to extended supine burials were not associated with gene flow from Anatolia, which is opposite to what has been observed in regions further to the west. The resurgence of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry tends to be associated with Western hunter-gatherers, but it does not necessarily exclude other local hunter-gatherer groups, and it's also not restricted to the Middle Neolithic. This study on the genetic prehistory of the Baltic Sea region makes it clear remarking that local foraging societies were not completely replaced and contributed a substantial proportion to the ancestry of Eastern Baltic individuals of the latest Late Neolithic and Bronze Age. A resurgence that, according to the authors, recalls the same phenomenon observed in the European Middle Neolithic. What this clearly shows is that hunter-gatherer ancestry did not disappear overnight when farmers came onto the scene. There was a clear east-west genetic division extending from the Black Sea to the Baltic, established during early post-last glacial maximum dispersals and maintained throughout the Mesolithic and Neolithic ages. In the eastern side of this division, highly developed hunter-gatherer societies persisted with stable, complex, and sometimes fortified settlements, long-distance exchange, and large cemeteries. On the other hand, the western side experienced a cultural and genetic turnover since the early Neolithic, but remaining pockets of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers were still around for quite a long time. A widespread increase of this ancestry, though, essentially happened during the Middle Neolithic, being the rise more marked in much of Northwest Europe, while in Iberia, the increase was slow between the early Neolithic and Chalcolithic. And now, it's time to talk about the Yamnaya, or steppe ancestry, associated with another crucial transition in Europe. 
It's composed of Eastern hunter-gatherer and Caucasus hunter-gatherer admixtures in roughly equal proportions and was carried by steppe herders who lived in the Eastern European plains. The main expansion event to the West began approximately 5,300 years ago. Although there is evidence of earlier contact with farming societies, at least 1,000 years before in today's southern Ukraine, as shown in this recent study. However, the roots of this ancestry go back much further, since we now know that at least 7,300 years ago, hunter-gatherers from the Middle Don River region in the Pontic-Caspian steppe carried admixture related to Mesolithic Ukrainian hunter-gatherers, as well as up to 24% Caucasus hunter-gatherer admixture, representing the appropriate balance of Eastern hunter-gatherer and Caucasus hunter-gatherer ancestry. So it is possible to consider them valid candidates for a northern proximate source that contributed to most of the ancestry found in steppe-related genomes. Once the expansion started, the steppe ancestry reached most parts of the continent in less than 1,000 years, becoming dominant in individuals from Britain, France, and the Iberian Peninsula, even though today, it's not particularly high in the latter two regions, in contrast to the British Isles, Northern and Eastern Europe. No one questions that the spread of Indo-European languages and the steppe genetic impact are related, but where and when Proto-Indo-European was initially spoken is still debated. There are two popular hypotheses that tried to explain this, as well as the expansion. The Anatolian or farming hypothesis that posits a dispersal with agriculture out of parts of the Fertile Crescent beginning as early as 9,500 to 8,500 years before present and of course, the even more famous steppe hypothesis that posits an expansion out of the Pontic-Caspian steppe no earlier than 6,500 years ago, and mostly with horse-based pastoralism, more than a thousand years later. But seems like a hybrid model, or hybrid hypothesis, actually reconciles current linguistic and ancient DNA evidence, proposing an origin south of the Caucasus around 8,000 years before present, followed by a branch northward into the steppe region, consistent with the apparent lack of direct connection between the Anatolian and steppe branches, and the expansions from Eastern Europe that maybe came too late for the language chronology of Indo-European diversification. The latest DNA evidence, though, puts the spotlight on the North Caucasus region, showing that the likely route connecting Anatolian speakers with Yamnea, and thus with the speakers of Indo-European languages, is from the East, involving Caucasus Lower Volga people who had mix with Mesopotamian-related people, subsequently heading westwards into Anatolia. An alternative route from the west is also possible, but less likely according to Dr. Iosif Lazaridis, who still thinks other models must continue to be explored, like this one, or an eastern entry model in which Caucasus Lower Volga ancestry is incidental, rather than the one transmitting pre-Anatolian languages. Regardless of which hypothesis is the right one, the Yamnaya culture still seems to be a central element when it comes to the expansion of the Indo-European languages, and many of the samples analyzed belong to the most common paternal haplogroup found today in Western Europe, which is R1b. R1a, in contrast, is the most frequent in Eastern Europe, showing a strong correlation with Indo-European languages of Southern and Western Asia, Central and Eastern Europe as well as Scandinavia to a lesser extent, but it hasn't been reported in Yemnaya samples. Courted where culture individuals, though, have very similar autosomal DNA and normally carry paternal haplogroup or 1A, which suggests both Yemnaya and courted where groups descend from a common source. But a recent study checking long DNA segments shared between individuals is challenging that notion and concludes courted where ancestry must share recent co-ancestry spanning on the order of at most a few hundred years with Yemnaya steppe pastoralists in the late 3rd millennium BC. As for the Bellbeaker culture, it certainly brought very high levels of steppe-related ancestry to Britain, and a significant amount was introduced in regions like Iberia and the Italian peninsula. What exactly happened that resulted in a replacement of Y chromosomes during the Bronze Age, we'll never know for sure but seems like, unlike Anatolian farmers that most likely migrated with their families and at some point incorporated Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, it is very possible the steppe migrations mostly involved men 
who basically established families with different local women, killing the other men. It is obvious that violence should be taken into account, but new research proposes patrilocality and polygyny as the main factors to explain this dramatic decrease in male genetic diversity. And well, to associate the steppe exodus with hunter-gatherer ancestry is quite obvious, and we've already seen a resurgence of local hunter-gatherer ancestry after the Middle Neolithic has been documented, so some may wonder, why is not the steppe genetic impact another resurgence event? It probably has to do with the fact that outside the steppe, this ancestry was always non-local, and that the different associated cultures spread Eastern hunter-gatherer and Caucasus hunter-gatherer admixtures to all European regions, but since the latter was absent, or very low in most of Europe, the steppe ancestry didn't quite match any of the local hunter-gatherer ancestries. There is one more thing to mention about the steppe migrations, supported by multiple studies. Basically that the steppe ancestry, spread with globular amphora culture-related ancestry, groups that occupied much of the same area as the earlier funnel beaker culture and the individuals tested, came out mostly Anatolian farmer, but having also up to 30% hunter-gatherer ancestry. Cultural connections between the Yemnaya and globular amphora culture, as well as between cordedware groups and globular amphora culture, have been a subject of discussion for quite some time. And according to ancient DNA, there was definitely more than that. In this study, for example, the Yemnaya samples were found to carry amounts of farmer and western hunter-gatherer ancestry, concluding admixture with globular amphora culture groups could explain it, although the Kukutini tripilia individuals from Ukraine are another possibility. The genomes of the Fadianovo culture are quite interesting as well, a Calcolithic and early Bronze Age culture within the wider cordedware complex, roughly from 2900 to 2050 BC, and in this study, the authors used globular amphora, yamnaya, and western hunter-gatherer samples to model their ancestry. Also, the research checking long DNA segments shared between individuals does not only report a close link between yamnaya and cordedware groups, but also that individuals related to globular amphora contexts from Eastern Europe must have had a major demographic impact early on in the genetic admixtures giving rise to various cordedware groups, including as far as Scandinavia and Russia. And finally, the latest relevant publication confirms that cordedware groups carry a mix of steppe-related and Neolithic farmer-related ancestry, the latter deriving exclusively from a genetic cluster associated with the late Neolithic globular amphora culture, and that this ancestry co-occurred with steppe-related ancestry across all sampled European regions. So all of this suggests that the spread of steppe-related ancestry was predominantly mediated through groups that were already admixed with globular amphora culture-related farmer groups of the Eastern European Plains. The events that unfolded in the steppe region finally led to the dissolution of the genetic, economic and social east-west border that persisted for several millennia, possibly due to environmental factors with regions east of the division having more continental climates and harsher winters, perhaps less suited for Middle Eastern agricultural practices. Technological innovations such as ox-drawn wheeled vehicles around 5,500 BP, as well as the later development of horse riding, combined with possible changing environmental conditions, opened up the steppe as an economic zone, and Enealithic settlements along river valleys were replaced by the new mobile economy of Yemnaya steppe pastoralists. The result was steppe-related ancestry, spread to all European regions, a much faster transition than the Neolithization process, which basically completed the modern European gene pool, mainly including Yemnaya or steppe ancestry, Anatolian farmer ancestry, and Western hunter-gatherer ancestry, each population having unique proportions, and some could be better modeled adding Iberomorusian, Eastern, and Caucasus hunter-gatherer references. Anatolian farmer ancestry is very high in Southern Europe, especially among Sardinians, while in Northern Europe, the levels of steppe ancestry and Western hunter-gatherer ancestry tend to increase. The Baltic populations 
having the highest proportions of these ancestries, are overall the closest to Western hunter-gatherers, and are also quite similar to Eastern hunter-gatherers, even though the closest populations in this case live in what's now modern-day Finland and Russia. Regarding pigmentation of ancient populations, Western hunter-gatherers are normally predicted to have been dark-skinned with blue eyes and dark hair, but this is different among Eastern hunter-gatherers and Caucasus hunter-gatherers, both carrying alleles associated with light skin and both having brown eyes for the most part, even though blue eyes and light hair have been reported in some Eastern hunter-gatherers. The Yamnaya and early farmer samples, even carrying the main alleles associated with light skin, nearly fixed in this case, are mostly predicted to have brown eyes, dark hair, and intermediate skin color, showing very similar allele frequencies when it comes to light pigmentation, and it's not very different for globular amphora culture and corded wear samples, but some definitely had blue eyes and blonde hair. During the early Bronze Age, the bell beaker culture brought higher genetic variants associated with light skin and eye pigmentation, a finding reported in Britain indicating Neolithic individuals were likely darker on average, but when we check other contemporary cultures like the Fadianovo, none of the samples are predicted to have pale or very pale skin. I have to say, though, that it's possible to find studies predicting pale skin for a few globular amphora culture samples, along with blue eyes and or blonde hair, and even a late Mesolithic Western hunter-gatherer found in Brittany, has been predicted to have pale to intermediate skin color. So a few samples are not representative, and the fact pale skin finally increased in Europe looks like a slow process involving a series of mutations that continued during the later stages of the Bronze Age and likely in the Iron Age as well. There is also data on how ancient ancestries contributed to present-day variation in complex traits, and these sources are enough to get an idea, even though we find contradictions that reveal some aspects are still debated. Here's the summary. Western hunter-gatherers have been associated with both lower and higher cholesterol levels, which is one of the most remarkable contradictions. A significant contribution to light eyes, but not lighter skin or hair pigmentation, seems to be in agreement with the samples tested so far, and this ancestry is also linked to higher heart rate, higher body mass index, Alzheimer's disease, and diabetes. Anatolian farmer ancestry is relevant when it comes to malignant neoplasms of skin, ease of skin tanning, irritability, guilty feelings, lower heart rate, and lower body mass index. It's also quite interesting that in the main papers covering this, we can see this admixture likely contributed to light skin, light eyes, and light hair, but it's still true that most early Neolithic farmers are predicted to look different. The Yamnaya or steppe ancestry, it's unclear if it contributed to lower or higher cholesterol levels, since both results have been reported, same as we've seen regarding Western hunter-gatherer ancestry. The information on hair color is also confusing, since studies have found higher contribution to both black and blonde hair. Lactase persistence is normally associated with this ancestry, basically cause the allele responsible is more common in Yamnaya samples but it's still debated how relevant the contribution was. It's widely accepted, however, that this component contributed to increased height, strong complexion, and light skin. Also, a recent scientific report discusses that steppe pastoralist populations brought higher risk of multiple sclerosis. And finally, there is little information about Caucasus and Eastern hunter-gatherers but seems like the former contributed to darker skin and hair color, and the latter possibly have something to do with mouth ulcers, Alzheimer's disease, and facial aging. In particular, hunter-gatherers from the Caucasus contributing to darker skin pigmentation may seem weird considering that light pigmentation alleles have been found in both Caucasus hunter-gatherer and early Neolithic Iranian populations, but let's not forget that even some Western hunter-gatherers were apparently light-skinned. More research is of course needed to confirm some of these observations and to make new discoveries. Okay, so that's a lot of information I finally managed to put together, 
definitely useful to learn about the two major genetic transitions in Europe, with a particular emphasis on the resurgence of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer ancestry and the diversity of these groups. I want to make clear before ending this video that I'm aware minor ancestries, Paleolithic DNA, or more in-depth discussion on haplogroups are topics that deserve more attention, so I will consider bringing content on these subjects as well. For the time being, I just hope you enjoyed this video, essential to understand how Europeans came to be. Please drop a like, leave a comment, and consider subscribing if you haven't yet. All the best to you all, see you next time.